Okay, on your mark, get set, go. Today we teach you guys a uh, new operation. Yesterday you learned this thing and it looked like this. What did we call that? Do not say multiplication. Composition. You were in function composition yesterday, okay? So composition is one type of operation. Today you learn what we call an inverse. An inverse operation is not 1 over f. We do not take the reciprocal, okay? So we're going to teach you what that means. Before we talk about function inverses, we have to talk about what it means to be one-to-one, -one, okay? One-to-one. -one. You can write it down if you want. You don't have to. We'll see if this sounds familiar. A function is said to be one-to-one -one if every element of the domain corresponds to exactly one element of the range. Does that sound familiar? Because that was the definition of a function. But it says also, and every element of the range corresponds to exactly one element of the domain. So it switches back and forth, okay? So for example, okay, let's say Sophie and Mikey are playing soccer. Is it possible for Mikey to score two goals and Sophie to score three goals? Yes. Is it possible for them to both score five goals? It is. But if that happens, we say that it's then not a one-to-one -one function because I would have to say this. Which is the player that scored five goals? And you guys would say, well, there's more than one. Do you know what I mean? So there would only have to be one for each domain and one for each range. And it turns out that uh, in order to determine graphically whether something's one-to-one, -one, we can use a test. Now, if I draw this function... I'm going to draw it like so. Does that pass the vertical line test? It does. So therefore, it is a function. The test that we're going to use to determine if it's one-to-one -one is the horizontal line test. Does it pass the horizontal line test? No. So this function right here is a function, but it's not one-to-one. -one. Whereas if I drew something that looked like this, okay, does that pass the horizontal line test? Yes, yes so that is one-to-one. -one. In order for a function to be one-to-one, -one, it must pass the horizontal line test. Okay? So we can work function composition with basically any function. We can't work function inverses unless they happen to be one-to-one -one functions. Only one-to-one -one functions have inverses. Okay, so what is a function inverse? Again, f inverse of x does not mean 1 over f. So what does it mean? Okay, we don't take it to the negative 1 power. We don't uh, multiply by negative 1. Here's what a function inverse means. The domain of the function becomes the range. And the range of the function becomes the domain. Or in other words, x becomes y and y becomes x. That's what happens when we do a function inverse. So I'll give you a very boring function. My function is 3, 7. It's a singular point. Everybody agree that's a boring function? But it is a function, okay? If I determine f of 3, what that means is I plug in an x value for 3 and I get out a y value. If you have an x value of 3, what is the y value that's determined? 7. If I have an x value of 7, what is the y value determined? Um, if you look at this function, is there ever an x value of 7? There is not. We don't have an option. There is no f of 7. We don't have one. This makes no sense to us. Everybody agreed? So, what does function inverse mean? It means this. If you do f inverse of 7, it means instead of plugging in an x value, we're plugging in a y value. And instead of getting out a y value, we're getting out an x value. 
So F inverse means if you have a Y value of 7, what would the X value be? The X value would be 3. And if I said, what is F inverse of 3, that would mean if you had a Y value of 3, what would the X value be? Do we ever have a Y value of 3? No, so this doesn't make any sense to us. So when you say F inverse, we're grabbing a Y value and producing the X value. So let's try a, uh, a basic example here. Okay. It says, given f of 2 is 3, so what that means is you go through the coordinate 2, 3. f of 1 is 9, f of negative 3 is 8, and f of 4 is 5. And it tells us that the function is, in fact, 1 to 1. Find the following. f inverse of 8. That means given a y value of 8, what is the x value? Yeah, this here tells us that if you plug in negative 3, you get 8. So f inverse of 8 would produce negative 3. And f inverse of 3. Two. Yeah, this one right here says a y value of 3 has an x value of 2. f inverse of 5. You can see right here, a y value of 5 has an x value of 4. And here a y value of 9 has an x value of 1. So that's your most basic example. I think we could all handle that on the test, couldn't we? Good. Let's look at one that's a little bit more complicated. This is one that you would see on the ACT. It says, given f of x is 3x minus 8, find f inverse of 6. Very good. So you know that y is 6, and we are looking for the x value. So do I plug in 6 for x? No. Where do I plug in 6 for? Yeah, for the f of x piece. So 6 is equal to 3x minus 8. Now we know how to determine that. We just add 8. So 14 is equal to 3x. Divide by 3, and x is 14 thirds. So 14 thirds is the x value that produces a y value of 6. I can't see you as well because of the light. So I'm trying to read your facial expressions. Almost like back, remember when we all used to wear masks? It was very difficult as teachers to see what the kids were understanding what they were because I read your facial expressions so often. It seems like we're all okay with that basic stuff so far. Okay, now let's move on to something that's more fun. Uh, it says find the actual inverse of the function. So instead of finding a inverse value, we can actually, each function has its own inverse. And so I'm going to write this as y is equal to 2x minus 5. And I will find its inverse. And we said that its inverse is when we make the domain the range or the range the domain. Or in other words, we make the x the y and the y the x. So anybody want to guess what I do to find its inverse? Yeah, I just switch them. So I replace the y with x, and I replace the x with y. And as I replace them, I then solve for y. So instead of a y equals 2x minus 5, I will add 5 to both sides to get x plus 5 is equal to 2y. And then I divide by 2, and you can write your answer as x plus 5 over 2 is equal to y. That would be one way of writing it. Or if you'd like to divide each part by 2, uh, you could write it as 1 half x plus 5 halves is equal to y. Question? Yes, you sure can. Please take out your graphing calculator. <laughs> Although function inverses uh, I'm sorry, although function composition is not used that much, we are going to use function composition later on with inverses. Inverses do come up a fair amount, so you're going to see them as this course goes on uh, probably three or four more times throughout the year. Um, so this is something that's going to be helpful for you to reference. This is one of my favorite parts. I love it when math connects in multiple ways. It helps me remember better. Do you ever have that moment where you're like, oh, I see that now, where you're like, 
oh, I see that connection, or oh, that makes sense and I'm going to remember it. When that happens, you guys, you're actually building neurons in your brain. You're actually getting smarter. So we're going to, we're going to give everybody a chance to get smarter right now because you're going to be like, oh, I didn't know that, and, and that will happen. So we'll, we'll see that happen here in just a second. So I'm going to graph uh, my original function, which was 2x minus 5, and then I'm going to graph my secondary function, my inverse, which was uh, 0.5x or 1 half x uh, plus 2.5 or 5 halves. So I'm going to graph those. If you want to follow along, I'll let you type that in. Give you give you another few seconds here to type that in. And so that we're uh, viewing in the same window. Do you remember what I press? I press zoom what? Six zoom standard brings us to that 10 by 10 viewing window. And so I have my first function. It's down below here. And then the other one's up above. I want you to look. It's kind of neat here. Where does this first one cross the y-axis? Negative five. So that means that uh, the other one would cross the x-axis at negative 5. Yeah, and look at this first one. It crosses the uh, x-axis at 2.5. Where does the other one cross the y-axis? 2.5. See how they switch? The x-intercept for one becomes the y-intercept for the other, so on and so forth. But here's the really cool thing. If, in fact, they are inverses of each other, they should be a mirror image of one another reflected over the line y equals x. So if I go into my uh, equation here and I type in y uh, is equal to x, I'm going to actually make that bold so that it stands out. I'm going to make it bold. I, I like to do that in this situation. And now I press graph. Notice how that middle line, it just divides it perfectly in half, doesn't it? Yeah, so we've reflected things over the x-axis. We've reflected them over the y-axis. We've flipped them about the origin. In this situation, it's actually reflected on the line y equals x. Like, well, well, why would we do that? Well, hopefully it would make sense to you a little bit now why we would reflect over y equals x. And it'll produce the same image. So I use that uh, to check my answers from time to time. Okay? All right, let's try one that's a little bit more complicated. We've got uh, uh, this one, which is y is equal to 2 minus x over 3x minus 4. So the instructions are to find the inverse. What should I do first? Good. So I've got x is equal to 2 minus y over 3y minus 4. What makes this one different than the ones we've already done? There's two y's. They're located in multiple spots, and that's going to create a little bit of a challenge. I've prepared you how to do this back in section 1.5. We'll see if you remember. What do you think I do in order to try to... Uh, yeah, I'm going to cross multiply and get the y's kind of on each side. So if I cross multiply, I get 2 minus y on one side. And the other side, so I'll do this side first. I'll go 3xy minus 4x equals, and then 1 times 2 minus y is 2 minus y. Yeah, let's not do that right now. You're right, we could factor an x out. That's not going to help us right at this moment because instead of solving for x, we're actually solving for y. So do you remember, so uh, first uh, quarter we were solving for x in this situation, but now we're solving for y, so what should I do? Yeah, gather the y's on the same side. So I'll go 3xy, and I'll do plus y, and then I'll move that negative 4x over, so I have 2 plus 4x. Good, so you had a good suggestion there that I gather the y's on one side. Now that they're gathered, what should I do? Yeah, I isolate the y by factoring out that greatest common factor. I'm left with the 3x plus 1 is equal to 2 plus 4x. Now I divide each side. I've got 2 plus 4x on top. And on the bottom, I've got 3x plus 1. And you notice it's actually similar to what we started with, but it is definitely different as well. Um, so, yeah, if you want to check it graphically, you could. We all good with that? Okay. Okay, flip it over. What's that? Yeah, so in that situation, we factored it out, and we divided it off. You don't have to factor 2 plus 4x because nothing actually cancels. Yeah. Uh, 
Okay, um, I never liked this problem, so um, let's just change it. I wish I would have changed it earlier. We're just going to change it to 2 minus x cubed. So instead of 3x cubed, it's just going to be x cubed. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to find the inverse of that. So I switch the x and the y. So x is equal to 2 minus y cubed. And what do we do to both sides? Add the 2. So x... Um, or subtract the 2. Yeah. Minus 2 is equal to negative y cubed. Now what? Divide by a negative 1, so I get 2 minus x is equal to y cubed. And then? Good. So the cubed root of 2 minus x is equal to y. And so that should be the inverse of that. Again, I'm a little bit skeptical. I am a skeptic. I'm not going to lie. Uh, I like to verify things. I like to look for proof, conjecture, all that good stuff. And so I'm going to type in 2 minus x cubed. And then I'm going to look at this one, which is a cube root of 2 minus x. A uh, cube root function is, is in math number 4. I type in 2 minus x. And if I've done it correctly, then those should be reflected perfectly over the line y equals x. Let's see what we get. My cube root function, or my cube function, and then my cube root is like that. And let's see if, yeah, would you say that one is the other flipped over the that line? Yeah, perfectly divided in half, yes. Yep, negative x, yep, so if you write cube root of negative x plus 2, that's fine as well. Either way. You guys try starting this last one on your own. Try D on your own. You don't have to foil out the x minus 4. You can just write as x minus 4. Okay, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Uh, before we even start to solve, I want you to show something interesting because this is the one hiccup to uh, this inverse piece. I, I want you to see it. We've actually known about it. We just haven't seen it come up here yet. Notice how this is a square root function. Somebody remember what a square root function looks like? Yep, good. Looks like that. And then uh, it's, what's the horizontal shift? Uh, left. left one and then up four. up four. So if I go left one and up four, one, two, three, four, notice how I have uh, this function. Everybody agree that that's a good estimation of that function? Okay. And what would you state is the domain of that function? Good. Negative one to infinity. You guys are sharp. And then uh, my range is going to be? Order infinity, great. So we've got that going for us. And we said that that in this situation, that, that when you take inverses, that the domain becomes the range, and the range becomes the domain. So I, I know right now that the new domain is going to be 4 to infinity. But it's interesting, when you went and solved for this, you probably subtracted the 4, got x minus 4 is equal to the root of y plus 1. And then you squared both sides. You got x minus 4 quantity squared is equal to y plus 1. And then you subtracted the 1. You got x minus 4 quantity squared minus 1 is equal to y. Is that, is that what you got? Now, now I want you to think about this because this is, this is really, you should have an aha moment here. This makes what kind of a shape? A parabola, and it's shifted to the right 4 and... So if I go 1, 2, 3, 4, and I go down 1, I'm sitting right here, but you say it makes a parabola. And, well, what we just learned was that an inverse reflects, right? I've come up with two parts, haven't I? It, it, is a parabola 1 to 1? It isn't. When you square both sides, it produced a second half. A second half that you don't want. Does that make sense to everybody that this is 1 to 1, but this is not? So what you actually have to do is you have to say, you know what, I, I want this function, but I want to get rid of that stuff. Like, I do not want that. 
So if you come up with this on the test, I give you two points. But if you want the third point, you're going to have to say, I want y is equal to x minus 4, y squared minus 1, but only for a domain of 4 to infinity. I only want it from this side over. Do you see that? We had to restrict the domain because we came up with something that was not one to one. And so that's part of the question. When you come up with x squared, can you think in your mind, oh, hey, that's no longer a one to one function. I'm going to have to do something about that. But most of the time, I've learned that most students, they don't think about the shape when they're actually working with it. And the more you can think about the shape ahead of time, the better off you're going to be. All right, let's do our last pieces. Flip back to the other side, our last piece of notes, then we can try this uh, our last deal. Yes, sir? Yep, exactly. Yep. The last thing we want to do is we want to be able to test to see if something is an inverse. And I'm going to bring you back to your basic elementary mathematics here. Uh, we would say that negative 3 plus 3, we would say that those two numbers are what we call additive inverses. Because when you add them together, you get 0. And we would say that 1 fourth and 4 are what we call multiplicative inverses. Because when you multiply them, you get 1. So these are what we call the additive identity and the multiplicative identity. Okay, They produce something when you work the inverses together. So what is it about inverses? What should they produce? If you compose two functions and they produce just x, that is the uh, composition uh, inverse. Okay, And if you compose it the other way, you should also get x. So just like 0 and 1 have very important properties uh, during addition and multiplication, x has very important properties under composition and inverses. So we are going to compose them together and produce x. And if we do, then that means that they are inverses. So it says use the property of inverses to determine if they are, in fact, inverses of each other. So here's what we're going to do from yesterday. We will compose f of g. How do we compose f of g? You did this yesterday. Good. You take this equation of g and you drop it in over here at f. And so we get 3 times the quantity. I'm going to use parentheses. x plus 5 divided by 3 minus 5. And now you need to show me in what order do we do this. Do we add the 5 and the negative 5 first, or do we do 3 over 3 first? Which one? Yeah, the 3 divided by the 3 will cancel, correct? x plus 5, and then 8 minus 5. And what is x plus 5 minus 5? It is x. And so, therefore, we are good to go. But composition is not what we call commutative. Just because it works one way doesn't mean it works the other way, so we have to also do g of f. And if I do g of f, now I have to take this f function here, and I drop it in over at that spot there. And what is that going to look like? Good. 3x minus 5 in parentheses plus the 5, all divided by 3. What's going to reduce here first, the 5s or the 3s? The 5s do, in fact, reduce. I get 3x over 3, which is? So yes, they are, in fact, inverses of each other. So if they both come out as x, they'll take an f of g even. Yep. If they both come out just x, x is the final answer. You are correct. If one isn't, if one isn't then, then they are not inverses. Okay, next one is a rational function. This is going to be a little bit different. Uh, let's try this one out, see how this works. I'm going to erase this over here. And I'm going to start by composing f of g. So that means I take this and I drop it right there. So I'm going to have 1 over... This thing goes in for x, so 1 over x plus 2. Whoops, sh shoot, I should have a minus 2, then a plus 2, right? 
minus 2 plus 2. Okay, so what do I reduce first? Yeah, the negative 2 and the positive 2. So that will be 1 over 1 over x. And how do I do that? We don't like to divide fractions. We multiply by. And what is the reciprocal of 1 over x? x. So if I multiply by x, then I get x. Isn't that beautiful? And then the next one, I will compose g of f. As I compose g of f, I grab f, and I drop it right in there. So I'll get 1 over 1 over x plus 2, and then a minus 2 on the end, right? So do I reduce the 2s first? No, first I flip. Yeah, I multiply by the reciprocal. Does everybody see that if we just multiply by the reciprocal here, you're just going to get x plus 2? And now the 2 is reduced and I get x. Sometimes people love to get to this part of the test and then just write x and cross a bunch of stuff off. Um, not good enough, okay? Show me your steps. No. We're going to not do this one at the end here, letter D. Uh, letter D does not work, but uh, we are going to do letter C. Uh, this is the last one I'd like to do. Notice it says f of x is 4x squared, but it says only for x greater than or equal to 0. This is connect with what we've talked about twice now. What is the shape of 4x squared? Is that 1 to 1? No, so it would not have an inverse unless we cut off part of it. And so it says only for x greater than or equal to 0. So it, it just wants that side of the parabola. Is it now 1 to 1? Yeah. So we're going to see if these are inverses. Let's compose them. f of g. So I'm going to grab what g is. The square root of x over 2. And I'm going to drop that right here. So I get 4 times. And I, again, I love to show parentheses. That way it helps me. And I get 4 times x over 4. And then the 4s will cancel, give me the x. So that does work. Yay. What do I have to do now? I have to compose g of f. And so I will take uh, this and now drop it in there. Square root of 4x squared over 2. Do I reduce 4 over 2 or do I take square root first? Square root, what's square root of 4x squared? 2x over x. Whoops, sorry. 2x over 2, which is x. And because we produce x in both situations, we can say, in fact, that those are inverses of one another. So you've learned actually a lot of new things during this unit. You've learned about function operations. You've learned about function composition, function inverses, more about domain. Whereas the beginning of the year, a lot of it was uh, uh, kind of review stuff, wasn't it? Um, next unit is going to be kind of half and half. Uh, second semester, almost every single day is brand new. And so what that means is that we actually go at a little bit slower pace, which is nice. And it's actually third quarter, your grades are out of this world. I mean, your grades third quarter are going to be so good. Uh, they're going to be great. Fourth quarter is a little bit more challenging. But the key is if your person misses a lot of school, then second semester can be kind of tough <laughs> because every day is brand new. Even though it's not super difficult, uh, it's all brand new. So anyway, you're ready to uh, begin that last assignment. Uh, you guys are good to go. Thank you for your hard work. Video.